Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to the London School of Economics for the opening night of our LSE Festival 2030, Shape the World. My name is Neenu Shafiq, and I'm the director of the London School of Economics and Political Science, and I'm delighted to see you all here. Our festival is taking place throughout this week until Saturday as part of a whole year of activities of, for the LXC to explore how the social sciences can make the world a better place. Over the course of the festival, we're bringing together academics, global leaders, innovators, change makers to investigate how we can learn lessons from the, for lessons from the past, tackle the challenges today, and shape a better future. Themes like environmental activism, inclusion, measuring inequality, combating fake news, and garnering a better sense of the past so we can implement Okay. <laughs> to begin this exploration, <laughs> tonight we are due, we have a panel of outstanding LSE academics who will give a perspective from various parts of the world based on their research, asking the question, what will shape the world's current political, economic, and social landscapes in Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Americas? And how do they see the changing world from the perspective of those different parts of the world? And what do they think the agenda for the social sciences should be? I will briefly introduce uh, each of the speakers. Unfortunately, Kay Eugen, will be unable to join us this evening because she is unwell. But I'm going to ask the other speakers at the end to say a few words about China. But we do have with us Peter Trubowitz, who is at the end, Professor of International Relations and Director of the US Center at LSE and Associate Fellow at Chatham House. His main teaching and research interests are in the fields of international security and US foreign policy, and he writes and writes frequently on US politics, which is rather topical at the moment. Uh, at the right, at, in the middle, we have uh, Professor Simon Hicks, who is the Harold Lasky Professor of Political Science at LSE, and he is one of the leading researchers, teachers, and commentators on Europe and comparative politics in the UK. He's published over 100 books and articles, and has won several prestigious prizes and awards for his work. And then in the, at the end, we have George Ofusu, who's assistant professor in the Department of Government here at LSE. His research focuses on political accountability, election integrity, legislator behavior, and the quality of democracy with a focus on sub-Saharan Africa. So you can take part in this debate by participating on hashtag LSE Festival or hashtag LSE, LSE sorry, hashtag Shape the World. The event is being live streamed, and so we welcome those of you who are watching from outside the theater and do join in in the conversation. For those in the audience, please put your phones on silent, and uh, we will try and record this event and make it available on podcast. Now, after tonight's discussion, for those of you who are, in we're interested to know which regions of the world you think will be the ones that will experience the most profound economic, social, and political changes in the next decade. So each of you should have a keypad in your hand that was given to you by the ushers, and at the end of the event, I will tell you what to do with it. So let's start by asking Peter Trubowitz to start the conversation. <coughs> very good to be here tonight. I want to thank uh, Manoush and, and Simon Hicks for um, inviting me to, um, to participate. So we all got our marching orders, and uh, I've been tasked with um, the United States. Now, there's no shortage of things to say <laughs> about what's going on inside the U.S. and why you should care. And my job tonight is not to convince you that it is the region it's most likely to go hell to hell in a handbasket, um, but it might be. Um, but what I thought I would do is focus my attention um, on here tonight on a problem that I think um, 
poses the most pressing challenge for uh, the world, and that is American leadership, or put another way, America's deepening disengagement from the liberal international order that it did so much to help build in the decades following World War II. Um, much has been written about this. Um, there was a conference, a Munich Security Conference, two weeks ago, which was very focused on this issue. Um, a lot has been written about Donald Trump's um, contribution to it, if you will, um, his role in all this. Um, my sense is that the process has clearly accelerated on Trump's watch as president. But I also think the pattern predates it. Indeed, Trump, I think, is as much a symptom of what is unfolding uh, as he is a cause. And to understand why, it's important to recall what made America's support for liberal internationalism possible in the first place. Now, the answer, of course, is many things. Um, but I think two things were really fundamental. The first was the presence of a geopolitical rival, namely the Soviet Union, that gave American leaders and the country at large a large set of powerful incentives to invest in military power and military alliances to preserve the balance of power on the Eurasian landmass and to deter others, most conspicuously Moscow and for a time Beijing, from taking advantage of political instability, either in the Eurasian heartland or in the rimlands that ran from the Iberian pe Peninsula all the way down to Southeast Asia. The second factor was a deep domestic commitment to economic security and social protection for average Americans. And it was rooted in the great New Deal party system of the mid 20th century, this progressive commitment to social equity that made it possible for successive presidents, Republican as well as Democratic, to overcome long-standing domestic resistance to pooling American sovereignty with other nations and multilateral institutions. And what emerged from this was an interlocking network of international, economic, political, and security institutions and treaties that came to define the liberal world order that, well, many of us, some of us in this room grew up in. And that commitment America's commitment to that order was impressive. And it lasted for over four decades. And during that period, Washington invested a great deal of treasure and a fair amount of blood, <coughs> sometimes wisely, sometimes foolishly, to prevent hegemony on the Eurasian landmass, while also continuing to invest in international institutions to expand trade, to open borders, and to promote investment. Yet no sooner did the West celebrate, begin celebrating the defeat of the East in the 1990s, than America's commitment to that order began to fade. That is, Americans' commitment to that order. For Americans, the collapse of the Soviet Empire meant that it now had an unprecedented range of freedom internationally. Now that wasn't true, but most Americans in the 1990s weren't alive back in the 1920s. That was the last time that the United States had a great deal of geopolitical slack or freedom of maneuver that it chose not to exercise back then. The 1990s were America's unipolar moment, to borrow Charles Krauthammer's phrase. Among other things, it meant that Americans no longer felt the compulsion, 
to invest in the production of international security, <coughs> at least not at the same level that the United States did during the Cold War. Now, to be sure, the September 11th attacks challenged the idea that American security was abundant and plentiful, but as gut-wrenching as those attacks were, they didn't alter this basic structural reality, nor did the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Barack Obama captured the basic idea in a very famous interview that he did in The New Yorker, where he said, the United States has so much strategic depth that he no longer really needed a, a George Kennan, a geopolitical thinker, like a Henry Kissinger, to help design a strategy to navigate and contain foreign threats to America. Now, by itself, the absence of a geopolitical challenger might not have been enough to tip the scales against liberal internationalism in the United States states, but it was accompanied by a steady decline in American political support for economic openness, institutionalized cooperation, and multilateral governance. And this is evident in the following slide. Do I click it or do you click it? Let's see. Where is it? And what it measures here is um, party platform support for liberal internationalism just in the United States from 1970 to 2017. And the data comes from a, a cross-national database that a lot of people use called the NFSA database. And it's essentially a measure of both positive statements for it's kind of like a net or a ratio of positive and negative statements for liberal internationalism, for liberalized trade, for international institutions, for multilateral treaties, and statements against them. And so what you can see, and it's not, I mean, it is not a direct measure of public opinion. But political parties have a huge incentive in structuring platforms in such a way that appeals to both, both the city gate proxy and, as it turns out, the tolerance city colleagues give public opinion. The trend line here is pretty clear. Party support for liberal internationalism has been weakened in the United States since the 1980s. And as we can see, this trend accelerated in the 2000s. Now, many factors have contributed to the weakening of this support. One is certainly voters declining confidence in the liberal order's ability to deliver economic security in the form of good paying jobs. We know that. Another is growing concerns, especially in the Republican Party, about the sovereignty cost of America's international commitment infringements, which many Republicans say, on national economy and latitude. What Donald Trump did here was to take those two costs, the cost in economic security and the sovereignty cost. And to think about it another way, these two truths have been present in the United States for 50 years under the heading or the rubric of American policy. <coughs> that he was able to win the presidency on a bold anti-globalist platform 
I think is evidence enough that many Americans have also written the liberal international order off. Now, whether the rest of Americans end up there, well, that remains to be seen. But the takeaway here is not the usual story of America's relative decline. It's not a story about China eating into America's market share or Russia outmaneuvering it geopolitically. Both of those things are happening. But the real story here is one of American retrenchment and retreat. If America continues to retreat from the world that it did so much to build, it will be because more and more Americans on both sides of the aisle conclude that order is no longer fit for purpose, no longer fit for America's purpose. Now, that international order is not going to just suddenly disappear. And the U.S. is not going to be riding in the caboose. It's too big and it's too damn dependent on the world for that. But if this continues, it will be an order where America is no longer steering the locomotive. And that, my friends, will be a big change. How big a change? Well, that depends on other regions of the world and how it stacks up and who put it in context. I'll leave it there. Okay. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> now let's turn to George Ofusu, who will talk about the challenges that Africa raises and poses to the world order. So thank you, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I will try to focus this talk on what I believe is uh, one of the key challenges to uh, democratic governance uh, in Africa and uh, what we can do about it and how that sort of fits into how social scientists, uh, as scholars, what we can contribute to trying to tackle this challenge. So on, on the 17th of February uh, 2020, the Togolese uh, Electoral Commission banned the main observation group, the monitoring organization that was scheduled to monitor the country's presidential elections. Uh, it revoked the ac accreditation of that organization on the basis of the fact that this group were going to interfere in the elections. Okay. This was five days to the elections and the group was scheduled to deploy about 500 people across polling stations uh, in the country. Now election observation groups have been emerging not only in Africa but in other parts of the world, both Latin America, even in the US and, and the UK, you find a couple of groups that volunteer their time to sit at polling stations, watch the election processes, and, and report on how the processes went. Now, this has implications for election integrity, and I'm going to tell you why that has an implication for integrity. And that also implies that there, it has implication on the confidence that citizens have in elections that are conducted on the continent. So the Al Jazeera quoted a student that they interviewed just simply saying that they are not going to go to vote. I can't go and queue to cast my ballot for a change that never comes. When I know my vote will make a difference, maybe I will change my mind. Before we sort of understand what has just happened in Togo, we need to sort of take a step back to figure out wh why we came to that stage. 
Well, this is the president who won the election uh, in Togo by 73% of the vote, uh, Fari Nyasinge. Well, he took over from the dad, Eyadamir uh, Nyasinge, who ruled the country for 38 years. He himself took over the reins of power in a military <coughs> coup. Well, so they have essentially, the dynasty of Nyasingbe has been ruling the country for about, you know, 40 years plus 2004 up to now by the sun. So many years. Essentially, it's a dynasty uh, running on the basis of electoral competition. Now, why would they take an interest in banning election of the voting group? Well, we just have to look at the Afrobarometer, which is a survey of citizens in Africa around the globe. They now operate in about 38 countries on the continent. And it's essentially ask citizens their, their views about the economic performance, the presidency, corruption, and so on the country. For the last three rounds of the Afrobarometer, citizens' view of how the presidency is doing, essentially corruption, has been declining. Like people have said there is increasing corruption in the presidency. A lot of people, about almost 70% of people say the country is heading in the wrong direction. But that means that allowing for a free and fair elections would mean people would take off this president <coughs> from power. And that means they have an interest in banning groups whose sole purpose it is to interfere in the election. Okay. Now, sim similar trends about how bad performance of regimes is across the continent. Since the Afrobarometer started in 1999, citizens' evaluation of the performance of many central government has either remained the same or they have worsened. I'll give you a couple of examples. <coughs> So when it comes to whether the government is managing the economy well, in, 19, in 2004, uh, where they conducted the second round of the survey, 16% said the government was doing really bad. Well, in round seven, which is about just a recently 2017, 2018, 30% said they were really doing bad. Now, between that time, the people who have said the government was doing well was only 10%, and it has not changed a lot. So in spite of the conduct of elections, evaluations of government has either been worsening or remained the same. Things are not improving. Uh, citizens don't contact their local governments, uh, either because they fear they will pay bribes, or they simply say it's just difficult to get the services they need from government. Now, several efforts, including the one that I've shown you, like a civil society group trying to monitor the election, make sure the election was credible, have been happening on the continent. So things about information dissemination, about performance of government, civil societies have been doing that, especially in Uganda, in Ghana, and so on. There are gender campaigns that are focused on trying to ensure that women representation increase in, in the hopes that that would improve governance. There is civic education against vote buying, violence, debates. Uh, there's monitoring of service delivery by citizens, organization groups, and the exposure of corruption. There's monitoring of abuse of incumbency. There's monitoring of election fraud and violence, which the Togo group was trying to do uh, and were banned. Now, such efforts, I would argue tonight, first would use some social scientist effort. And the reason why I say so is as follows. Well, when they are implementing all these interventions, policies, we often ask ourselves, are these interventions effective? And if they are so, why? Under what conditions do they work? Well, as social scientists, we care about questions about how do we motivate principals to work on citizens' behalf. So in this case, politicians, how do we make them work on, on citizens' behalf? And what is the effect of institutions, information structures, and incentives on political behavior? 
we care about these questions, but policymakers also care about how to make politicians work. So we can work it together to find solutions that make that work. But some would argue that, you know, if we focus on these minor so-called interventions and so on, does it not distract us from the more pressing institutional challenges on the continent? Well, I'm going to argue that understanding the micro foundations of what citizens want, politicians' behavior, would provide an evidentiary basis for the macro level institutions that we all want. Strengthening parliament, strengthen, strengthening the judiciary, and so on. Okay, so I'm going to sort of premise this on a work that I have done, uh, which has to do with the same election observation group. But to answer the question whether making election work promote political responsiveness. In 2012, uh, the, late, um, the late Kofi Annan uh, launched a report that essentially talked about how to make elections work and security situation more stable on the, on, in a global setting, but especially for Africa. One of the, uh, or two of the interventions that they proposed was to promote independent election bodies, but also election observation which shows how prominent that is for Togo's regime to re retain its place in power. Now, the question I ask is whether, you know, fair elections in improve responsiveness as, you know, Kofi Annan and his team wanted us to believe. And if it does, through what channels does that work? Okay. Now, there are two things that you might think of. If they restrain politicians from manipulating the elections, they would then invest their time in satisfying the needs and wants of, of citizens. Is that true? Well, we have some inferential challenge with the normal tools that we normally use, right? Policymakers will cite countries that are doing relatively well and say, well, because they have credible election, that is why they are doing well. Well, in other countries that they don't, you would think that that's what is explaining why the country is doing bad. But we also know that that's probably fallacious or not sound basis for thinking about this question. Well, it could be that because the country is developed, they are also able to run cred credible elections and the other way around. Okay. So what we need is, for example, a random variation of the quality of elections. Obviously, that is hard. How do we impose credible elections on one country and not on the other one? That's a hard question to answer. So what we can do is actually to think about how civil society organizations are trying to do their job and also leverage that to answer such a question. And I focus on election observation. Again, going back to the Togo situation, but moving you to Ghana where I did this, with this work. Right? They are all over the place, right? Uh, between 1990 and 2006, and the data can go on, almost every election now has the presence of domestic election monitoring, okay? Now, what we need is to be able to sort of randomize where these election observation groups go. Most of the time, they don't, they go to trouble spots uh, where they had observed violence or fraud the last elections and so on. And as social scientists, we collaborate with this group and say, can we randomize where election observation groups go? I randomize the intensity of where they also go, like the, to what extent are uh, uh, polling stations monitored across different constituencies. Now, what I find in the first stage of this exercise was to demonstrate that if you heavily monitor elections, like in constituencies where there were heavy presence of election observation groups, there was less fraud and violence. That serves, that serves as an instrument for us to figure out whether by decreasing the level of fraud and violence, politicians work harder on behalf of citizens. What I did was then to track the performance of members of parliament over time 
both what they are doing in their constituencies and what they are doing in, in the legislature, basically focusing on attendance. What do I find? Well, politicians who were elected in this intensive monitored elections seem to have worked hard by spending their money on public goods. Coincidentally, <coughs> the, uh, the effect of such monitoring didn't have any impact at all on whether they attended parliament more, which just implies that that's not what citizens care about, and this is very apparent in most of the surveys that ask people what do people want from, from their members of parliament. I have evidence uh, to show that it is the expectation of being punished in elections that makes politi politicians work hard, especially if they, are, uh, if they are monitored very hard. Now, some concluding remarks based on this. This sort of demonstrate that we can sort of collaborate with policymakers, with election observation groups, with people who are monitoring incumbency, uh, trying to <coughs> give information about politicians' performance to learn about how effectively they can do these kinds of jobs. So that's, that's the first point. Uh, designing effective policies, however, I would argue, also requires that we understand some basic facts about how politics work on the continent. So we, for example, need some more work that would understand what citizens want from politicians, what are the determinants of vote choice, and these are not very well sort of researched and we need to put more effort into that. How do politicians then respond to that, both within their districts and in parliament? But also we have to pay attention to something that I've not talked about, and this is about campaign finance. Uh, a lot <laughs> has been written and said about African politics, but we don't have basic information about how campaigns are financed. And that obviously has implications for the quality of elections, which I've argued is very important for political responsiveness. Thank you. Now let's hear from Simon Hicks with a European perspective. I haven't got any slides. Um, I was going to talk about uh, three things. Well, two, two really related to my own research. On, I, I study both comparative European politics, but also European integration and the process of, of the development of the EU. And I, and I think there's both of those areas, I think, have really important things going on over the next few years. And I think social science has some interesting things to say about them. And if I have time, um, there's a whole third set of issues I wanted to talk about, which are about the role of the social sciences in general in Europe and some of the challenges the social sciences are facing and what that means also for LSE in terms of its challenges as a social science institution in Europe. Um, so first thing I want to talk about the national level in Europe. And, and one of the, the major things that I think social scientists, political scientists in particular, are worrying about is a crisis of democracy in Europe. So in a sense, if there's a sort of thread that runs through Peter and, the, and the, the challenge of or declining attitudes in the US towards uh, liberal internationalism and George and a crisis of democracy in Africa. I mean, it, it's, it's remarkable. We thought that there was democracy was on the rise everywhere, and we thought that Europe, of course, democracy is very well founded. But we've seen one of the most dramatic changes we've seen in European politics over the last two decades is the rise in populism. Now, it's not a you know, sort of throwaway thing to say, and we can think very specifically about what do I mean by populism. I take Cass Muda, who's a Dutch political scientist. He, I think for me, he has the most tractable and clear definition of populism. He says that populism is a political position which, it, which characterizes politics as a battle between the virtuous public and the corrupt elite. That sort of articulates that this is the new conflict in the world and the politicians speaking on behalf of the virtuous public against the corrupt elite. The corrupt elite have stitched the economic system uh, stitched it up in such a way that most of the economic benefits are going to, to an elite group in society. They've, they've stitched up the political system in such a way that <coughs> it's very difficult for anybody that opposes that status quo 
um, to actually win or, or, or gain space in the political system. They've, uh, educational institutions have trained generations of elites to go into the media, the judiciary, uh, the civil service, um, all the senior elite positions in society and the cultural institutions and the social institutions that, that keep perpetuating the sort of benefits and, uh, of that elite and perpetuating the sort of ideology of that elite. And, and this used to be a sort of minority opinion in many countries. You'd get parties that would uh, you know, espouse that kind of view that would get between 5 and maximum 10% of the vote. Well, if you look across Europe, and we've collected data on every election in Europe from 1918 to the present, in 31 countries across Europe, we've got about, about 700 elections uh, from 1918 to the present. And you can see in 2019, uh, populist parties across Europe were getting around about 25% of the vote on average across Europe. And have now actually entered government in several countries with this position. So most obviously we talk about Poland, where the Law and Justice Party in Poland is clearly a populist party that, that aims, as part of its manifesto, very clearly to take on the liberal internationalist institutions, to anti, uh, take on the judiciary, take on the central bank and the civil service, the media and so on. We can see this with Viktor Orban in Hungary. And we've seen it now in Italy with, with the first time in Western Europe we've got a, 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 an openly populist government uh, that was led by, with Salvini in the government. He's now left, but then he will put, perhaps could easily win the next election. We've also seen populist parties supporting governments in other parts of Europe, in Denmark and in Finland, and a rise in, in this sort of populist attitudes or, or votes for populist parties. We've also seen mainstream parties adapt and respond to populist parties. So we've seen... Mostly on the centre-right, we've seen parties adapting a sort of populist rhetoric, and you can see that even in British politics, where el elements of what Boris Johnson stood for at the last election, and we can see now, you know, we've seen it playing out in front of us now with the battles between the, the politicians and the, and the senior members of the civil service. The civil service are, are a corrupt establishment trying to prevent any stage change from the status quo, and the new politicians are coming in and saying, we're standing up for the people. We want to deliver on the agenda that the people voted for, and these, these civil servants are trying to stop us. And you can hear that actually on the Today program in the mornings. Uh, this is what the conservative politicians say. And, and you can see the fact that, you know, they're saying, we, we're not even sending our ministers to even go on the media anymore because we don't trust the media. We're going to take on the BBC. They're a corrupt establishment elite, and so on and so on. And, and just wait, the judiciary will be next. Uh, particularly after the uh, famous woman with the brooch who took on the government. Um, you can see even that sort of rhetoric now as, as mainstream <coughs> centre-right parties in many countries across Europe, not just in the UK, Scandinavia, uh, battle going on within the German CDU about whether they pitch in a more populist direction or not. Certainly the Austrian party, the new Austrian prime minister, very much with that sort of angle. And we can see that playing out in France with the French centre-right, thinking about how do they position themselves with really... Uh, Marine Le Pen very much being the party that really is, is, is challenging Macron. So populism is on the rise. Uh, Matt Goodwin, who's a, a British political scientist, he wrote a book um, that was predicting this several years ago. And he said, look, it's here to stay. It's not going to go away. The, in a sense, we've seen a shift in the political axis across Europe from politics being about economic left and right, where on the right, uh, political parties were about raising, uh, about cutting taxes, cutting public spending, more liberal open markets, and the left was about raising taxes, increasing public spending, regulating markets. It was, that was most of European politics in almost every country in Europe for most of the post-war period from 1945 to around about 2010. Now the battle is won between the liberal internationalists, of which you know we, here we are sitting on the stage, and, and perhaps quite a few of you in the audience too, and you know, we're the, we are the liberal internationalist uh, status quo or establishment, if you like, and the, the populist hordes at the gates who are saying, no, this global economic and political system that has been playing out in, in the post-war period has not been delivering for us. We've seen growing economic inequality, not just individual inequality, but regional inequality. In fact, uh, regional inequality has grown faster over the last decade in most countries in Europe than individual level inequality has. And regional inequality leads to a whole lot of other enormous challenges. And it's interesting now how the real agenda, the core agenda of the British government here is now reducing regional inequality in the UK about trying to invest in infrastructure that's going to change, decline, uh, overturn what has happened with rising regional inequality. It's the same debate in many, many countries across Europe. If it was just about economics, it would be much easier to fix. 
because you could just say, okay, we, what we need to do is we need to borrow or increase taxes and increase public spending to reduce inequalities in society, to increase spending on healthcare and education and infrastructure. But there's a whole other side to populism, which is not just about economics. It's about a cultural backlash. Peter Norris, a political scientist at Harvard, has written a book arguing that it's not just about economics, it's largely a cultural backlash. And she uses public opinion data across the world and shows that most of this opposition to the establishment is not just about inequality. In fact, there's large portions of the popular <laughs> support base which are actually pretty secure suburban middle classes. The middle classes who, who are in suburban areas around major cities, who in a sense are older people who've who, who have paid off their mortgages, uh, maybe they're close to retirement or they've retired, um, they've, got mo they've, paid, they've, they've got very little debt right now, but they've got relatively low income, um, and they don't like the cultural changes that have happened over the last 30 or 40 years in Europe. They don't like, particularly they don't like very open liberal immigration policies and the fact that we are all now de facto multi-ethnic, multi-religious societies in Europe. They also don't like some of the changes that have happened to gender equality and the growing women's rights. They say, why can't we go back to a society that I was much more comfortable with and a whole range of different dimensions. And so you can see now this growing battle between what is essentially an urban, very liberal cosmopolitan, urban political set of attitudes and cultural values and a more suburban or rural, more traditional set of cultural values. And that correlates much more with the new dimensions of politics very, very difficult for mainstream parties to address those cultural challenges. Because it would mean going against some of the things that we fundamentally think are, are, are real core values now in our society. No major mainstream centrist party of center left or center right is now going to have a policy that's anti-immigration. No major center left or center right party is going to have a policy that says, oh no, we want to roll back on the rights of women that we've established. So the cultural issues are much, much harder to address than the economic issues. And that's why I think this is a major challenge uh, of domestic politics and where we're heading in terms of democracy at the domestic level. Moving to the European level, and of course this plays out in terms of attitudes towards the European level, because these populist parties are very anti-European. But equally, you have a, a, a deeper structural problem with the way the EU works. And I've been teaching you know, EU politics for 25 years, so, so it's really difficult for me to say this. But, but the e EU not just faces a challenge with Brexit, the EU faces some deep, deep structural challenges in that it was set up as an organization, as an architecture to deliver economic growth and increasing economic freedoms and increasing economic opportunities for Europeans. That was the logic behind the Treaty of Rome. That was the logic behind the single market program and the creation of, of the single market in Europe on the 31st of December 1992. And over the last decade, decade and a half, it's completely failed to deliver growing economic opportunities and economic growth. Europe is one of the regions in the world that has seen comparative decline economically in terms of its GDP, in terms of its relative GDP per capita globally, in terms of its economic importance and influence on the world. And in a sense, people now look at the EU and see the EU as part of the problem rather than the solution. And I think that relates not just to Brexit, but opposition to the, to the architecture in Europe. And if you talk to European elites and leaders in capitals across Europe and the policymakers around them, they'll say the solution is more Europe. The solution is deeper integration. The, solu the solution is deeper integration of the Eurozone so you can pool public debt in the Eurozone to prevent a Eurozone crisis and make the Eurozone work properly. The solution is a bigger European budget to start to address some of the deep infrastructure problems across Europe and to address things like uh, to establish common European unemployment insurance, for example or to redistribute wealth between some of the richer and poorer Europeans across, uh, regions across Europe. They'll say that the solution is more common European policies on migration to deal with migration challenges, common European security and defense policies, perhaps a European army, particularly if the US is going to be withdrawing from its commitments globally within NATO, Europe needs to step up and, and look after its own defense. So from that perspective, the solution is more Europe, but the public is very, very reluctant to, to support that. And there's nobody coming up with a new architecture <laughs> for designing what this new Europe could look like. So br what I worry about with Brexit, I actually worry less about the UK. We'll be fine. We're a, we're a globally, comparatively wealthy country. You know, I remember, I remember talking to an LSE alumni uh, association group in, in Greece uh, on Brexit and all the economic models that we had in different places at LSE and what the impact of Brexit would be. 
And I remember, you know, if you talk to the LSE Alumni Association in Greece, sitting on the front row is Simikis, the former Greek Prime Minister, and the governor of the Bank of Greece, and the president of the University of Athens. These are all LSE alumni in Greece. <laughs> and, and I gave my presentation, and of course, Simikis, the former Prime Minister, asked the first question. And he says, oh, Professor Hicks. He says, so you're telling me th the worst possible scenario is that Brexit has an impact on British GDP of 5%. And I said, yes. And he looks at me and he shrugs. <laughs> <laughs> Greece had an impact of 25% hit on its GDP. To him, this sounded like a rounding error. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yes, it's disastrous, but actually, you know, we are a relatively wealthy, comparatively globally a wealthy country. We will be fine. I worry about Bre what Brexit means for contagion for the European project. Once we're at the end of it, there will be a new model of Britain's relationship with the rest of Europe. There'll be the Swiss model, the Norwegian model, and there'll also be now the British model for the relationship. And other countries will look at it, and if it's seen at all to be working, if Britain is at all seems to be growing faster than the rest of Europe, for example, people will look at it and go, we can pass through the pain Britain went through and just get there very quickly. And I think that's the worry for Europe. That's the worry, for example, in for Sweden, for Denmark, for the Netherlands, for other countries across Europe who may then see it. And that's what <laughs> I worry about in terms of the unraveling of the European project. We take for granted a lot of the benefits that have been associated with creating the world's first mark, supranational market on a continental scale with the de facto free movement of goods, services, capital and labor across 500 million people in Europe. It's a remarkable achievement in great historical terms. We take that for granted as European citizens in our day-to-day -day lives up to now. And we may think that, you know, we, we, will, we will miss it if it disappears, and that's what I worry about. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now, I'm going to ask each of the speakers to say something about China, uh, because it would be remiss not to put that on our agenda. We know the facts. Now the world's largest economy. It's also uh, the most important regional power in Asia and an increasingly important global power. It's building institutions, alternative institutions to the current liberal order. It's also presenting itself as an alternative model with a combination of, uh, of one party rule with state-led capitalism. It's also struggling with a huge challenge to its co perceived competence with the current coronavirus crisis. So, Peter, two sentences on your take on China, and then I'll turn to each of the other speakers, and then I'll open the floor to questions. Well, I mean, I actually can connect China to the story um, I was telling. I mean, the bottom line in the story I was telling is that there is a gap that exists in the United States. And in fact, this is true really of the West in general. Um, to just build off of Simon's presentation. A gap between the international commitments that Western countries have taken on and domestic support for them. And it manifests itself differently in Europe than it does in the United States. But this is a classic problem of kind of overreach. It's not classic in the sense of when we often think about kind of like Paul Kennedy-esque strategic overexpansion, it's military overexpansion. I think the story really is more one about institutional overexpansion, either investing too much in supranationalism in the case of Europe or the United States commitment to uh, all kinds of international institutions. And basically, the country has kind of, in a sense, overrun its domestic foundations. Now, how does this relate to China? There are basically three different ways to close that gap. One is to scale back the commitments, to reel them in. And that's some of what Donald Trump was trying to do when he says, you know, when you get the sense he's pulling back from NATO and he wants to welsh on commitments in, in um, 
uh, in Asia to America's traditional allies, and there's much less support for multilateral institutions and so forth. That's one way to go. Another way to kind of real, to, to close the gap, if you will, between commitments and domestic support is to invest very heavily on the domestic side. So one way for the United States to do that is to expand the welfare state, not to do what it's been doing, but to move in the opposite direction and to invest more heavily in health care, the kinds of things that you are, you're hearing a lot of in the Democratic uh, presidential campaign, investing in college tuition, health care, um, or what Donald Trump promised in the 2016 election, a huge investment in infrastructure of reforming it in the United States, renovating it and so forth. So in other words, to make it easier for people to support those kinds of commitments. Okay, that's a second way to do it. A third way to do it is, or a third way that it can arise is from a geopolitical challenger or a foreign threat. And that's where China potentially fits into the story. So there's a lot of chatter in the United States about the threat that China poses to the United States and to the West in general. And I would say that it has gained a lot of currency over the last mm, three to four years. And you can kind of trace it back. You could go back to Obama's pivot in uh, 2010, where there was a much more focus on Asia and a kind of rebalancing of America's commitments. And the, you know, the pursuit of the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, was part of that agenda. But I think what you're hearing much more of is that the United States needs to get much tougher with China. Now, whether or not that sticks, I mean, that is, it's still very unclear, but the same kind of rhetoric is unfolding in China right now. You know, there was a, at the New Economic Forum in Beijing, it was back in um, December, it was November, right? It was November, you were there, right. So you heard Henry Kissinger talk about how the U.S. and China were in the foothills of Cold War. Now, I don't know, you know, whether, like, Cold War is, like, the heights, like, you go up the mountain <laughs> or you go down into the valley. But what he meant was that things are not going well, but we are, it's still an early, we're at an early stage. But what he was concerned about, and actually, he didn't put it this way, what I'm very concerned about is that the domestic politics of the two countries interact and reinforce one another, that bring out basically the worst in terms of each other's foreign policies. I mean, you know, in my field, in international relations, we always talk about insecurity dilemmas, and they're a product of new technologies. One country invests in a new technology that poses a threat to another, and that can lead to a Thucydides trap and so forth. That's one way. But that's actually not what Thucydides talked about. What Thucydides talked about was how domestic politics in Sparta and Athens interacted to create a self-fulfilling kind of prophecy, a spiral. And so when I think about China and my concerns with China are, and are how China's efforts to promote its own growth, to develop, how those interact with what the kind of narrative and the trajectory that's taking place domestically in the United States. Thank you. I have to add a footnote, if I may. I think, the, 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 I think in China, there are two traps that the government is worried about. The Thucydides trap, which is mm -hmm. impossible to set, mm -hmm. which as most of, is, is the view that, you know, when you have a rising power facing an established power, conflict is inevitable. Um, but the other is the middle income trap, yeah. that yeah. they're worried that they'll get stuck at middle income, and there are many countries that get to middle income status but never get to high income status. And the, and the desire to dominate industries like AI and robotics, et cetera, is to avoid the middle income trap. And the irony is, is that this trying to avoid the middle income trap has set them on a conflict with the UN. 
because it's that worry the U.S. has about China dominating in all of these key new technological industries that has put it on a collision course with the U.S. So the, the, the desire to avoid the middle income trap has in some ways brought the, the facilities trap Indeed. into higher relief. George, from an African perspective, China, in one sentence, <laughs> or two. <laughs> I could do with two. Um, I think like the, the 90s, like early 90s, when demo the tad wave of democracy hit the continent of Africa, most were sort of enthusiastic about the role of the West uh, in helping both make a transition and also consolidate democracy. And the idea that, you know, we draw, you know, Africa draws on the strength of the de democracy strength uh, in the U.S. and the, you know, in Europe and so on, to you know, strengthen its own uh, democratic uh, institutions, and mostly it was like citizens drawing on, you know, effort, uh, effort by the West to promote such, you know, democratic transitions on the continent. And the key worry at the moment, uh, I think, on the continent is how the s achievement, if you want to think about it that way, 20 years, 30 years of democratic practices on the continent might be undermined by the growing strength of uh, China and its investment in infrastructure and so on on the continent. Mm -hmm. But I think we always miss the, the point that even though international actors played some role in the democratic transition and so on, we are now talking about status on the continent, that we probably didn't make a transition and the West didn't play that key role as we expect and that domestic political actors used what they could draw from the West to build whatever political kingdoms they wanted on the continent. So we might want to think as social scientists uh, as to why the China is now attractive to uh, mm -hmm. Uh, political leaders on the continent and the fact that even though there has been that idea that there was that effort to promote democracy it didn't achieve uh, as much as we thought it had achieved and mm -hmm. political actors still hold on that you know the past generation still hold on to power uh, now on the continent okay Simon um, I think about the issue facing China as a as a political scientist about you know, where is China heading? Because in the long study of democracy, one of the key arguments that have, has had power over time and space is that as countries get richer, they transition to democracy. This goes back to the you know, 1960s theories of modernization right through to the current, and there seems to be this long, you know, pretty strong correlation between growing economic wealth and democracy. And there's lots of different arguments about what exactly the pathways are and what causes it. But you know, Barrington Moore has this famous quote. He said, no middle class, no, no bourgeoisie, no democracy. Um, and China, of course, looks like it's bucked that trend, which is you know, you've got a growing economy. You've got growing middle class, very you know, provision of public goods by a non-democratic regime. Um, but more recent studies, I think, of the transition to democracy tell us something interesting about the context. Um, which is that, as a Morgan and Robinson, um, two American uh, political scientists based in the uh, political economists based in the United States, both with LSE connections, um, okay. one with a PhD here, one from, with an undergraduate degree from here, um, they ha have a theory about democracy that says it's all not just about economic growth; it's about income inequality, and what then the middle class think about income inequality. So, for example, what the middle class are worried about in a transition to democracy is that the average voter is poorer than them because then the average voter is going to redistribute their wealth. And so they, would, they have quite a nice explanation about why actually, why there's still, there's very continued high levels of income inequality in, the, in, in China. Um, economic growth does not necessarily then lead to the transition to democracy. There's one little caveat to that, which is a new book by, by Samuel's uh, Ansel and Samuel's on democracy, which George may, may know, which is, which is they talk about Brazil, and they talk about why then did you have very, very high levels of income mm. inequality in Brazil and still get a transition to democracy? And they say because for the middle classes, democracy was not about 
the, the average voter really should be doing well from setting tax rates. Democracy was about protecting the property rights of the middle class. It was about creating courts, mm -hmm. civil service, uh, proper regula regulations of finances. Um, and so one of the things I think to watch in China is what that new middle class feels about the regime. If there's a major economic downturn, a major economic crisis, the fallout potentially of coronavirus and what happens to that, does the state start, start to say, we need, we need assets, we need wealth, we need to actually take some of and tax some of this wealth that's being currently taxes on wealth in China are incredibly low. Because yeah. the state doesn't need them. It has state-owned <laughs> industries that generate its wealth. And so you're nouveau riche in China. You're actually really well off relatively. But what if the state starts to say, we're going to start taxing the middle classes because we need, we need these resources to invest in infrastructure, start to address some of the structural problems. That's when I think it's going to be start interesting to watch to see whether Lipset was right or whether Ansel and Samuels are right or whether uh, Asimov and Robinson are right. Okay. Very good. Let me open it up then to uh, comments. I'll take questions in batches. Of I may take a lot of questions, and then I'm going to come back to the panel in one round. Let me start with the woman here, and then the <coughs> two right here, and then I'll come to the back end in a moment. Hi. Um, do you think Trump's threat to impose duties on French products, such as wine and cheese, in, res sorry, in response to France's new tax on digital giants will come into fruition? And could it jeopardize the effort led by the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development to unite countries around a shared system of taxing technology companies? Okay, thank you. Uh, and then there were two right here. Uh, this is a question for Simon. I wanted to ask where you've seen the most successful opposition to populism in Europe, and what has made that successful, if there has been any. And then the woman in front of you, yeah. Um, I, I would like to ask you about if you have any thoughts about what is happening in Latin America, too, and the, the social crisis and the political instability that has been going on. Okay, thank you. I'm going to take three more, and then I'm going to come back to the panel. Could I go to the back of the room there? The two gentlemen there. And I have time for one more. The gentleman back here. And then I'll come back to the panel. Thank you very much for that uh, really insightful um, uh, talks. And um, I think the speaker has identified the current trends and the current social forces that are shaping the global social, political, and economic landscape, whether that be um, issues of democracy in Africa or the um, US's disengagement with the international order or the crisis of democracy in Europe. But in all these um, settings, what are the prospects for the alternative social forces, um, for the progressive, forward-thinking, youthful, left-leaning um, social forces that we don't see at the moment? What are the prospects, or is it the case that actually the negative forces that the speakers described um, are actually here to stay. Okay, thank you. Gentleman there, yeah. Uh, so hi, uh, my question is, um, if social welfare serves as a means to defeat populism, uh, yet with um, Bernie Sanders' uh, primary, we s uh, many see him as problematic for his socialist background. So my question is, can Western countries especially U.S., surpass the confined discontent on socialism and embrace, embrace welfare programs domestically. Okay, <coughs> thank you. Uh, and then the gentleman. Uh, yeah, I think my question ties in nicely with his. Uh, as uh, some of the candidates are now dropping out of the preliminaries, um, who do you think is sort of the best opposition that the Democratic Party should ultimately uh, choose? <laughs> is it, uh, We're looking for political is it Bernie? Is no, no, who's going to answer? Or, 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 is it, <laughs> or is it old Joe? Uh, I'd love to hear your opinion. Okay, very good. All right, so Peter, I'm going to give you Trump and French taxes, uh, Latin America, <coughs> can Americans have a welfare state, and any political predictions you'd like to offer in terms of... Um, 
Uh, well, and I, I, I thought Tom's question was a good one too back there. The question about um, how do you uh, how do you reverse the trends, basically? Um, I don't know about Trump in France, um, to be perfectly honest. Um, but um, you know, the thing about Trump is that um, he does like a photo op. So uh, there might be a way kind of out of this, but I, I think, you know, in general, um, uh, with respect to Europe, I mean, it's, it is remarkable how his position is, I mean, that he, I mean, I would say France is kind of, um, you know, not Im immediately like in the target, it's Germany in particular that he's, he's focused on, but he has been awfully consistent um, with respect to uh, trade issues, it seems to me, on, uh, on Europe. So I wouldn't hold my breath, I suppose, is what I would say there. On, on the question about Sanders and um, I think this dovetails with the question about can things be reversed. You know, I think you need to separate perhaps Bernie Sanders, who is quite popular, you know, among uh, many, many Democrats, um, from some of the from some of the policies he's pu pushing, which are very popular, um, and uh, and that Elizabeth Warren is pushing um, as well. And it's true that it sca they scare off Wall Street. Um, but, you know, when you look at public opinion polling, a lot of those progressive positions inside the Democratic Party do rather well. So this, I think, speaks to the question that was raised about reversing things. I mean, I think, you know, it, it takes time and in pushing on these things, and you don't do it all in kind of one um, fell swoop. But I, my sense is the in, inside the Democratic Party, the needle has moved. Now, whether or not the country has totally moved is, is less clear. But one of the things Donald Trump has learned and where he's incredibly vulnerable in this election, he's very vulnerable on health care. This was the lesson of the 2018 midterms where the Democrats ran. I mean, that's all they ran and they cleaned the Republicans' clock in the House. And I think it was very obvious from the way that Trump dealt with the State of the Union where he really focused on his purported accomplishments on health care that they recognized that they're quite vulnerable there. So I think that there are places kind of in the American kind of policy space where you can push in a more progressive direction and, and that these are issues that just even kind of middle of the road and conservative Americans are very, very concerned about. This is not a winning hand for Donald Trump. Other issues may be, but this one is not. Who's going to win on the Democratic side? God, I don't know. But, um, you know, uh, I think we will know on, um, we'll know by Wednesday, whether or not this is going to be a two-person race. And my own feeling is, is that, you know, this is looking more and more like it's going to be a contested convention. Now, that's what every political scientist dreams of, you know. We haven't had one in the United States since 1952. Um, and uh, what's that? Oh, I'm going to be so excited. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it's very good for people that like running numbers and testing theories and so forth, but it could be devastating for the party. It's 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 really kind of hard to to know, but just because of the the way that delegate selection takes place inside the Democratic Party, it's very hard to get to that. 1,991 number that you need. I mean, Sanders, you know, has a, is in very good shape, probably because of his position in Texas and California. Again, we're going to know by, by Wednesday to make a run at it. But he's, I think what most people looking at this think is he's going to come up shy also. So, you know, um, that's a dodge. <laughs>
<laughs> okay. But, uh, but, uh, but a reasonable one. Yeah. Do, do you want to say anything about the progressive politics in Africa and where those might be? So I'll, I'll look at it in from two sort of from two angles. Um, one is about like the deep support for democracy by citizens themselves uh, on the continent and the fact that they kick against any effort by incumbents to entrench their stay in power. So we see that in protests, uh, protests against trying to upend constitutions to extend uh, term limits and so on on the continent. Uh, we also see that in strong investigative journalism that is happening in many uh, places, exposing very deep entrenched corruption and so on. And that sort of enraged citizens and put them on the street. And so it seems like, uh, and some of this effort, I should say, has held back incumbents from going ahead with changes that they, they wanted to make. So in the case of Nigeria, back in um, uh, Obasanjo's era, they couldn't change the constitution for, to allow him to run again, for example. Uh, in some places, they have been successful, but in other places, they have not been successful. Um, issues of progressivism, if you, you know, if you think about it in a Western terms, like trying to push for more social welfare and so on. The debate has been more about development, uh, building infrastructure and, and so on at the moment. So at the current stage of the development on the continent, it has to do with how do we get this done? How do we get infrastructure development done? How do we develop the economy uh, that sort of benefit everybody? But all, all politicians, all regimes, campaign on the same issues, the veil of you know, issues. So it has to do, politics has been about who can deliver and who can deliver uh, in a more, in a less corrupt plate. <laughs> and uh, the effort has been in that direction. And that's why I think I focus my presentation, for example, on the fact that this institution's uh, elections, having clean elections, uh, having strong institutions in the judiciary and so on, uh, monitoring corruption is able to bite uh, politicians uh, and that's why they spend their effort trying to hold those efforts back uh, and so we should think more about how efforts are being made by civil society groups and individuals both in support of democracy and democratic reforms that they think would help propel uh, economic and infrastructure development Great. thank you simon Opposition to populism and maybe also progressive politics. And Latin America. Oh, and uh, Latin and America. America. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, although you know, we have kind of characterised uh, a sort of bipolar politics here of a sort of elite, a sort of social and economic liberal cosmopolitan elite, and a sort of populist mass. I mean, you know, politics is, of course, far more complicated than that. And and, and I, I think of it as really distinct social groups. And and one, you know. The, the coalition that's the populist coalition is two particular social groups. One is an older rural suburban uh, population that's more socially conservative, and the other one is a sort of angry economic underclass that's legitimately angry you know, against, against what has happened in terms of sort of income inequality and, and decline of industry and so on. But there's other, other types of groups, and one is a growing urban liberal young population that, that doesn't have the economic opportunities that their, parent, their parents had, mm -hmm. that, that, that has expensive housing costs, that they're saddled with debt, that, that is actually very socially liberal. Um, and, and what I find interesting is, is not you know, what mainstream party has actually managed to defeat the populist. What has happened where populists have lost major elections, like in France with Macron, or in, in, in Austria with the presidential election that was won by a green politician, or in different cities and countries across Europe, is when an alternative broad coalition has come together that has, that has built a coalition across a range of different groups in society that include a young urban uh, population that's got socially liberal, but also has got some major economic challenges, and also bridges across to that economic underclass in cities in industrial decline, and thinks about how do we also provide services, new infrastructure and social welfare that bridges that, that sort of coalition. And so it's a sort of progressive coalition that goes from greens 
who are social democrats, including some of those more Bernie Sanders type radical left. And when that coalition can come together around a new policy package, that takes the wind often out of, out of, a, pop, out of a populist sales, particularly on the economic dimension. And what I find frustrating across many countries in Europe is, is a mainstream center left. Mainstream center left that has a vision of itself as the party of government, that says we are the party of government. Don't mess around with these greenies or these social liberals or this radical left. Just vote for us. We're going to deliver. And you know the average vote now for mainstream center left parties across 31 countries in Europe, the percentage of the electorate they get is now 16%. 16% if you take the last election and average it across Europe mm. in 2019 um, of the percentage of the actual electorate. That's not a major party. That's not a major party of government. That's not a major party that can win and defeat the populist or even mainstream centre-right. So I think if it's, it's going to be something. It needs to be a much broader type of, of, of coalition. Um, what's interesting about Latin America, I mean, I ha we have a colleague in the government department here, Francisco Penisa, who's a professor of Latin American politics, and he wrote a book on it's from Uruguay, and he wrote a book on populism in Latin America about 15 years ago. Mm. <laughs> um, and I remember talking to him at lunch one day, and he said, welcome to my world, sir. <laughs> 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 What's fascinating about Latin America is it was originally a populism of the left, but the, some of the characteristics of it were very, very similar. It was anti-establishment, anti-elite, anti the kind of Washington consensus. Mm. Um, some of the, the groups that were underclass groups were voted to it in similar kinds of ways, driven a lot by large economic inequality, different social values and so on. Um, and, and that's still there in Latin American politics, particularly in Argentina and the way it's been playing out in Argentina. But, but Chile is something different. If you talk to Andres Velasco here, who's a uh, dean of our School of Public Policy, he's Chilean and was, in, was the finance minister in Michelle Bachelet's government. And, and, and talking to him about Chile, he says, what he finds astonishing is that this young urban middle class kids that are willing to take a torch to supermarkets and torch in you know, uh, stations, under railway stations, underground stations in, in major cities. And this is very angry, and there's something there about this is, these are groups that feel like their opportunities have been, there's been opportunities for previous generations. Their, their generation does not have the opportunities, and they are very angry in that sense. So they, uh, and they tend to be, they're more angry for, because they see corruption, they see an establishment that's not providing them with opportunities. That's a different kind of populism. <coughs> that's a different kind of backlash that's led from a younger generation. And, and I think there it's about when the economy stalls, when, when essentially assets are being centralized among older generations, that I think presents major problems for the national electorate. Okay, now it's time for you to have your say. So uh, if you could get your... <coughs> your voting uh, machines. Mm. And we're gonna put a question up. Here is the question. Which region of the world will experience the most profound economic, social, or political changes in the next decade? And if you could vote, we've got about, we'll, it'll take about 20 seconds. Press A, B, C, D, E, or F, depending on whether you think it's North America, South America, Europe, comma, Africa? Yeah. Middle East, <laughs> South Asia, you East Asia. Together, George. Hmm. <laughs> Seems to be rigging the vote a little bit, but anyway. <laughs> and the votes are coming in. It'll take about 20 seconds for it to settle down. Interesting. So. so we rigged it for our <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we don't know what's going so on. So Europe yet. and <laughs> Africa. Now we should definitely just. I'm just going to, if I could take a show of hands. For those who voted Europe, Africa, can I see the hands who voted Europe? Can I see the hands who voted Africa? Okay, that, Ooh, ma that, that makes sense. Interesting. That makes sense. So I think it's Africa <laughs> that has the high, so any reactions from our panelists to that vote? Well, no, given that breakdown, it suggests that East, East Asia, Asia is the one, and I would agree with that. Yeah. So. No. Very interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very interesting. So, uh, in aggregate... Can I vote for all of them? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can make a right. case for every single one of those yeah, regions. It's quite legitimate. Yeah. 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 Very <clears throat> interesting. So, much work for political scientists in the years ahead. Um, I think I will uh, take this opportunity to thank our speakers for a broad-ranging discussion. Join me.
I could remind you to put your voting pads and return those to the ushers, and I believe there are drinks outside for you to enjoy. Thank you all very much. Thank you.